I first want to begin the day by just thanking all of you in the audience, not just for being here today, but for the work we know you do every single day back home in your communities as community leaders working on this issue. As we'll talk about today, elder abuse is an issue that when you know about it, when you're active in it, it's usually because it's touched your life. My boss here at the White House, Valerie Jarrett, uh, who would be here today if her daughter wasn't getting married tomorrow in Chicago, um, wanted me to pass on how much it means to her that all of you are here talking about this today. It's an issue that she's dealt with in her own life uh, with her father who recently passed away in the last year. So um, I first want to let you know that as part of all this, the White House today is issuing its very first ever proclamation uh, commemorating World Elder Abuse Day. And we have copies of these. And I actually want to begin the day with an ask of all of you. Uh, we have a, a fantastic group with you here today who Kathy Greenlee will be introducing in a minute. But the ask I have of all of you is to use today not just as an event here at the White House, but as an opportunity to connect people to this issue, as an opportunity to spread the word. Now, how many of you have ever tweeted before? Okay, I see a few hands up. Those of you who haven't, uh, take a look at what Twitter is. Tweet about, tweet about what you learned about today, write about it, talk about it, grab three people at the grocery store tomorrow or this weekend when you see them. Talk about your experience here at the White House. Talk about what you liked, talk about what you didn't like, talk about what you heard and what you told us. And I ask you that for two reasons. First of all, I believe there'll be information shared both directions today that will be useful to people in the circles that you all work in in your home communities. But I also ask you to talk about your experience here at the White House to show that you were involved in the process. I think one thing we can all agree, in, agree on that we need more of in the United States right now is people believing that they can be part of the solution. And when they see all of you as community leaders who are here at the White House working hand in hand with the administration on these issues, they'll believe they can be involved in this and be leaders as well. So to kick off um, our event today and someone who made today possible, I'd like to invite up Kathy Greenlee, the Assistant Secretary at HHS for Aging and the Administrator for Community Living. Thank you, thank you. It's wonderful to see you all today. As John mentioned, tomorrow is the actual day of World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, and we're so pleased to be here today uh, to be able to commemorate this event. Uh, what we have brought together today is a fabulous partnership that's demonstrated both here at the front and the opening speakers, but also with you in the audience. People from the Department of Health and Human Services, from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the Department of Justice, as well as our partners in the financial sector and the Financial Services Roundtable that we're very glad to have all of you here with us today. We're very glad that today has arrived. Not this specific day, June 14th, but the day that we all come to the White House to talk about elder abuse. That's the most important thing. <laughs> here, but we want to let people know that we have um, we are video streaming this. We've been able to um, help with partners around the country, arrange for a number of watch parties, video stream. So we would also like to give a shout out to those who are watching it remotely today. Uh, this is not a Washington, D.C. issue. This is actually a national and international issue, and we need our partners all around the country to learn and listen and become engaged, which is what we're hoping uh, from you all as well. We believe that it's important and that we will demonstrate today federal leadership in this area of how we can work together as federal departments uh, and with the White House to end elder abuse. But our leadership will only be successful if we are engaged with you on the ground in communities and you are engaged with each other. So we have attempted to structure this uh, during lunch and other times of the day so that you can meet each other to talk about this critical issue for the people in your community and the kinds of things that you can do collectively to address elder abuse. There are two important people that I would like to recognize uh, first and just recognize their contribution to this field. The first one is Dr. Toshio Totara. Dr. Toshio Totara was a pioneer in the field of elder abuse and served from 1998 to 19, 1988, excuse me, to 1998 
as the project director for the National Center on Elder Abuse, which was funded by the Administration on Aging. He effectively managed the collaboration of four national professional associations, and together they undertook a number of projects to enhance elder abuse prevention efforts nationwide, including the seminal 1998 National Study on Elder Abuse Incidents, which is still cited widely today. Dr. Tatara was an authoritative voice on elder abuse issues, both in the United States and in Japan. He was involved with nearly 50 projects of national significance to the United States and to Japan, and produced over 100 publications in both countries. Sadly, Dr. Tatara passed away on April 23rd of this year. He will be sorely missed by his friends and colleagues, and we would be remiss today if we did not recognize his significant contribution to the field and honor his work and his memory. So I would like to just um, say thank you, I guess posthumously, to Dr. Tatar. The other person is <laughs> The other person we would like to recognize is Elizabeth Podniks. Podniks, I can say this. Dr. Podniks was a founding member of the International Network for the Prevention of Elder Abuse and the founder <coughs> of World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. She published extensively nationally and internationally on the topic of elder abuse and was principal investigator of the Canadian National Survey on Elder Abuse, which was conducted in 1989. In addition, Dr. Podniks has long been an innovator in raising awareness of elder mistreatment. The field of elder abuse awareness, prevention, and response owes a debt of gratitude to Dr. Podniks for conceiving of World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. She could not join us here personally, but we felt it was important to recognize that this is the seventh World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, and she started it all. So I'd like to give a shout out. So now I get to introduce our wonderful partners and panelists uh, that are here today to kick us off. And I will start with Kathleen Sebelius, Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. Secretary Sebelius was uh, appointed in 2009 to be the Secretary of HHS and has played a critical role, as you all know, in the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and has been the administration's chief advocate for promoting access to health insurance and more broadly access to health care, uh, whether it's for children, people with disabilities, seniors, all people across this country who need both access to insurance and care. Uh, before coming to Washington, she served for six years as the governor of Kansas, and I believe most people know that I have had the privilege and pleasure of working with Secretary Sebelius for 17 years now, which continues to surprise us both. <laughs> it's been that long. Uh, and when you work with someone in this many different capacities, at, at this many different levels, uh, we know each other fairly well, and this is what we would say about each other. This is an issue we share in common. This is an issue that doesn't surprise the Secretary when I say I want to talk about elder abuse. And it never surprised me that she's supportive and wants to do what she can do to provide leadership, not just to HHS, but to this administration as we work to address this terrible problem. I'm proud to work with her. I continue to uh, be pleased uh, to provide this type of public service and leadership, and just want to introduce to you all Secretary Kathleen Sebelius. I want to start by um, thanking John Carson uh, on behalf of the administration for organizing and helping us to um, be here at the White House. I think um, this doesn't happen by accident. It really is because the president considers this a priority that we are gathered here and not in some other agency building. So thank you, John, for helping to make that happen. Um, we wouldn't be here without Kathy Greenlee. She is passionate about this issue, and um, over those 17 years, I've learned that um, when Kathy cares about something, it's going to happen. And uh, I think that uh, her work on, on this issue, on gathering not only our administration colleagues, um, but certainly having you here in this room uh, is really an important initiative and an important gathering and I just want to thank Kathy for her passion on behalf of all the seniors who couldn't be in the room today but who will greatly benefit from this dialogue. Um, 
Jim Cole from the Department of Justice is a great partner in lots of areas. One of the things that we get to work on regularly, which also kind of falls into this purview, is Medicare fraud. And the Justice Department and HHS have really ramped up our efforts to go after people who would steal from the trust fund so that we return those resources to provide health services. And that's a, that's a piece of, of elder abuse, but in a little bit different category. But I'm so glad that Jim is here today. And Rich Cordray, uh, who's the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, um, not only does a great job as a consumer watchdog uh, here in Washington, but did a splendid job as Attorney General in the great state of Ohio, and it's great to have um, Rich here. Um, I do want to welcome all of you to this important conversation about elder abuse. Uh, it's a topic, as you know, that's critically important, but really hasn't gotten the attention it deserves. Last year, we started a trend where the first baby boomers, uh, the generation of Americans born after World War II, began turning 65. And since then, we have about 11,000 people a day turning 65. Between 2010 and 2030, the number of Americans 65 and older were nearly double. And the number who are 85 and older is on pace to grow by over 400% by 2050, 400%. Part of that is that Seniors today are living vibrant lives, well into old age, remaining active in their communities and living in their homes. But that means we owe it to them to ensure that they're safe and free from abuse and exploitation. Now, all states and communities have adult protective systems in place, but elder abuse still remains an under-recognized human and civil rights issue that demands our attention. Today we know that at least one in every 10 seniors is a victim of abuse each year. Elder abuse can take many different forms. It can be neglect by a caregiver, physical abuse from a stranger, mental abuse from a family member, or financial abuse from a trusted friend or a neighbor. In one case, Mrs. Smith lived on her own but with some of the cognitive issues that come with old age. When she told her neighbor and friend she wasn't feeling well, the neighbor asked what was wrong. And Mrs. Smith suggested that she hadn't been taking her medication as prescribed because she didn't have the money she used to and was cutting corners. So when the neighbor asked about necessities like groceries, Mrs. Smith told her that she'd been getting those thanks to a nice young man who had volunteered to shop for her so she didn't have to use public transportation. Luckily, that made the neighbor a little suspicious. She pushed Mrs. Smith on how she paid the man for the groceries, and Mrs. Smith replied that it really wasn't a problem. She just gave her friend her ATM card. Now, cases like Mrs. Smith's are just the ones we know about. The neighbor did turn in that case. Research suggests that only about one case gets reported for every 24 that take place. And abuse goes unreported for a lot of reasons. Seniors feel ashamed or embarrassed by abuse. They may think that if they report abuse, they'll be forced to give up their independence. Or they may fear that if they report something, the abuse will get worse. That's the tragedy. Even when seniors or others in the community want to report abuse, they don't always know how to take action. Right now, Adult Protective Services is handled at the state and local level. Some states do it very well, but in others, the ability to address this critical problem is inadequate. And at the same time, we've never had a coordinated federal response to elder abuse. Programs are largely fragmented, reducing their impact on the problem. And federal leadership has too often been lacking in the past. Seniors suffering from abuse often do so in the shadows. They have few people to turn to and few places to go. Many in our country just look the other way. It's a big national problem that we don't acknowledge at the national level. Now, the Obama administration is ensuring that this message doesn't remain in the shadows anymore. And that's what today's event is all about, raising public awareness of the problem 
so we can work together to end it. We've also taken some concrete steps to create the tools and resources we need to take on elder abuse. We supported the Elder Justice Act by ensuring its passage as part of the health reform law. Now that law has the potential to give federal government the tools to pre prevent, detect, understand, intervene, or prosecute in elder abuse. As part of the law, today we're announcing the creation of the Elder Justice Coordinating Council, which brings together departments across government, like the Department of Justice and the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau, to make sure that elder abuse remains a priority at the federal level. The council also will begin looking at state systems around the country that have gotten results and start the process of scaling up those best programs to the national level. But we haven't stopped there. Today I'm pleased to announce that we're putting funds behind this important law with a five and a half million dollar initial investment under the Affordable Care Act. to test, pilot, innovative elder abuse prevention programs with the most potential. And our goal will be to use the most successful programs to create effective methods of preventing elder abuse at the state and local level. Now the administration has taken these actions because they're the right thing to do. They show the nation and the international community that our country stands for the dignity of seniors and won't stand for abuse, neglect, and exploitation. But we have a lot more work to do. With the massive number of unreported cases that take place each year, we need to put an emphasis on education and on prevention. And that means getting elder abuse prevention resources in the hands of the public. It also means improving education in the medical, financial, and law enforcement communities to help them identify elder abuse, or the potential for abuse when they see it, and to take action. Now, as a former governor, I know that states have a critical role to play. And I urge each of you here today, and those watching across the country, to start bringing together state and local officials, community leaders, and those working with seniors in a broad array of fields to put an end to elder abuse. The goal is pretty straightforward to create a coordinated system that puts everyone on alert for elder abuse and creates an environment where no one looks the other way. We've taken some big first steps and now we need to keep working together to protect the lives and dignity of our nation's seniors. Again, thank you for being here today. Secretary Sebelius. Now when John opened, he asked if you were tweeting, those of you who have now learned since he asked. <laughs> I just want to point out the card that we had put out front so that you know the hashtag that we're using today is Protect Seniors. And for those of you watching online, if you want to tweet about this, that's the hashtag, Protect Seniors, uh, tweet during the day. So I'm very pleased next to introduce to you James Cole. James, Mr. Cole is the Deputy Attorney General <coughs> of the Department of Justice. He was sworn in in January of 2011. He first joined the Department of Justice in 1979 as part of the Attorney General's Honors Program. He served for 13 years in the criminal section and later was the Deputy Chief of the, Pro the Division's Public Integrity Session, Section. And this is the section that handles the investigation and prosecution of corruption cases. He has, in addition to spending time at the Department of Justice, an extensive career in private practice specializing in white collar crime. He's also been involved in teaching, fourth at Georgetown University Law Center, and has also been a lecturer at the Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. Uh, he's been involved in government service, private practice, and we are very, very pleased he's with you. We want to make sure in uh, acknowledging Mr. Cole, because in Washington, sometimes everyone's titles are very similar, that you understand that he is the number two person at the Department of Justice working directly with Attorney General Holder. And this, again, re reflects, I think, the Department of Justice commitment uh, to work with this administration and all of us on elder abuse. Thank you, Mr. Cole, for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, actually, it 
Attorney General very much wanted to be here today, uh, but unfortunately he is headed to Canada where he's going to be meeting with his foreign counterparts, and therefore it's my honor and privilege to be able to be here and to join with my colleagues, uh, Secretary Sebelius and Director Cordry, and all of you to commemorate World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Uh, as Kathy said, it's, it's a wonderful fact that this is here and that we are here to talk about it. At the outset, I want to commend Secretary Sebelius for forming the Elder Justice Coordinating Council. This is a critical first step that firmly demonstrates this administration's commitment to protecting our older Americans, and we look forward to working with our federal partners on the Council. It's worth noting in that in anticipation of the Coordinating Council, the Department of Justice, with the support from HHS, began working earlier this year on developing what we call the Elder Justice Roadmap. The Elder Justice Roadmap project has already sought input from hundreds of stakeholders from around the country in order to help identify potential policy, practice, and research priorities in the field of elder abuse, neglect, and financial exploitation. We expect the results of this roadmap to help inform the Coordinating Council as it moves ahead in developing its strategic agenda. I also want to thank Kathy Greenlee and all of her staff the Administration of Aging for their tireless efforts to protect older Americans and for organizing today's events. Uh, as Secretary Sebelius said, she is a dynamo and a powerhouse and none of this could have been done without her. Elder abuse is a hidden epidemic that annually impacts the health and well-being of six million older people as well as their families and their caretakers. It includes physical, sexual and emotional abuse, neglect, and what we're here to talk about today, financial exploitation. Victims come from all ethnic, racial, and socioeconomic backgrounds, and sadly, perpetrators of financial exploitation are more likely to be family members than strangers. This type of elder abuse depletes the resources of individuals, families, businesses, and public programs, including Medicare and Medicaid, by billions of dollars each year, placing enormous burdens on our health care, our financial, and our judicial systems. For me, and for today's Department of Justice, protecting older Americans is a top priority that we advance on multiple levels. For example, in order to protect the financial integrity of the Medicare program, as Secretary Sebelius had talked about, both the Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services decided early on to make combating health care fraud an enforcement priority and creating the Health Care Fraud Prevention and Enforcement Action Teams. It's a lot of words, so we call it HEAT. <laughs> Since HEAT began in May of 2009, we have recovered over $8 billion in cases involving fraud against the Medicare program and other federal health care programs. We also believe that this has sent a strong and a clear message that Medicaid fraud will not be tolerated and that the Department of Justice and the Department of Human uh, of HHS will act swiftly to stop it when it occurs. Just as important as protecting the fiscal integrity of the Medicare program is our commitment to ensuring our nation's nursing homes and other health care providers are actually providing the care and the services to which Medicare beneficiaries are entitled, as opposed to exploiting those beneficiaries and the programs for their own profit. And today, Tony West, the department's acting associate attorney general, has taken a particularly active role in supporting these cases, and later on we'll be discussing a particularly egregious example of financial exploitation. Protecting older Americans from consumer scams and fraud is also a top priority of the department. Just this past March, the department hosted an historic Consumer Protection Summit that brought together federal, state law enforcement and regulators and consumer advocates to harness our collective experiences and to discuss strategies for enhancing our civil and criminal enforcement of consumer fraud crimes. We are also looking 
to increase the public awareness about common schemes that ordinary citizens experience, and if they know about them, they can fight back. The department's Consumer Protection Branch has also done a terrific job combating consumer fraud on the elderly as part of a broader emphasis on fraud targeting all vulnerable populations. We've had successful prosecutions for a number of fraudsters who have targeted the elderly through reverse mortgage scams and lottery scams. And we have had enhanced public awareness about these schemes through our collaboration with organizations like AARP. Our healthcare fraud and our consumer protection efforts are just some of the ways that the department protects our nation's older Americans from financial exploitation. But while we've made strides to address this form of elder abuse, <coughs> enforcement alone is not a complete strategy. We can't simply prosecute our way out of this problem. Everyone here today knows that the way we can be most effective in protecting older Americans from financial exploitation is by combining our resources and our expertise and by collectively deploying the myriad of tools we have at our disposal. We need the federal agencies represented on the stage today. We also need adult protective service workers, long-term care ombudsmen, domestic violence advocates, geriatric specialists, the financial services industry, health care providers, advocates, state and local law enforcement and prosecutors, and what has been a missing link in this area, civil legal aid lawyers. Legal services programs have a unique opportunity to prevent and remedy elder abuse, especially the scourge of financial exploitation. For example, they can help prevent mortgage foreclosures resulting from a family member's theft of a senior's life savings. They can counsel worried older clients about the legal options for responding to debt. And better yet, they can counsel them about how to avoid scams that happen to them in the first place before they actually take their money. They can advise these clients on how to revoke a power of attorney that is being used by some unscrupulous person to exploit them. And they can offer elders a safer future by representing abused clients in obtaining protective orders. While this expertise can be critical to preventing or addressing abuse, legal service program staff too often don't have the specialized training on how to identify and support the older victim's needs and how to harness their existing expertise to respond to the older victim's special needs. That's why, with the essential cooperation of Legal Services Corporation Jim Sandman, who is here today, I am delighted to announce the Missing Link Project. It's a new collaborative effort by the Department's Elder Justice Initiative and our Office of Victims of Crime and our Access to Justice Initiative to develop such training services for legal services providers. President Sandman has pledged that when the training has been developed, it will be made available to all legal service programs, which together provide critically needed services to every county in this country. We are hopeful that the trained legal aid lawyers' efforts will be further leveraged by private lawyers who do pro bono work voluntarily, thus increasing the overall capacity to serve elder victims. Jim, we thank you for your commitment, and I also want to thank our Acting Assistant Attorney General Mary Lou Leary and the staff of the various offices at the Office of Justice Programs for their strong support of this effort, too. Too many elderly Americans are suffering alone, and together we can change that. We know the importance of your work on the front lines of the battle against elder abuse and financial exploitation, and what you do every day makes an extraordinary difference in ordinary lives. I want you to know that the Department of Justice is honored to be your partner in this endeavor. Thank you. All shouting in the back. I can hear you. <laughs> very exciting. Thank you, Deputy Attorney General Cole. Um, very, very exciting. I'm very pleased next to introduce to you Richard Cordray. 
Mr. Cordray is the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. He was nominated by President Obama in July of 2011 to become the first director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and was, uh, became director on January 4th of this year. Prior to joining CFPB, as Secretary Sebelius pointed out, he was on the front lines in Ohio serving as Attorney General. And in his work in Ohio, he focused on helping protect consumers from fraudulent foreclosures. He worked to recover money on behalf of retirees, really took a stand as a very active Attorney General uh, with the consumer lens and how he could uh, do more work. Uh, his consumer division saw increased numbers of complaints and they were more responsive as a group under his leadership. I talked to Secretary Sebelius several months ago about our partnership with Consumer Financial Protection Bureau and she said, I know Rich Cordray, he'll help, and he has. So I want to thank you uh, for your participation. You all her. <laughs> Th thank you, Kathy. I, I want to say first about my colleagues on the uh, panel here. Uh, Secretary Sebelius, uh, as was somewhat mentioned, uh, I am a friend of her family. She has deep roots in Ohio. Her father was governor of Ohio and one of the really outstanding progressive governors uh, that we've ever had in our state. Uh, and it strikes me as just right that she would recognize that in attacking these issues that she would take a pilot project approach because I think it's really important that those of us in Washington need to recognize that just because we're in Washington, and sometimes especially because we're in Washington, we don't have all the answers. And the best way to know what works is to try a number of things and see what works. That's a very practical approach. It's a sensible approach. It's one that we're also trying to uh, adapt at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And, and uh, with Jim and the Justice Department, uh, I have seen them to be great colleagues because I worked with them when I was the Ohio Attorney General on Medicaid fraud where they were especially effective at helping us uh, to root out fraud, waste, and abuse uh, in our system. And we're glad to be working with them now on issues of consumer fraud uh, with, with the uh, units of the Justice Department. And I also want to especially uh, thank him for his remarks today about legal aid, uh, because those of us who have worked uh, in the community know that one of the uh, uh, really unsung problems of our society is that middle class working Americans often have negligible access to the legal system to solve the kinds of problems that come up uh, in their families. And uh, that Justice Department is supporting and working with legal aid is especially important, uh, it seems to me. So thank you for having me uh, here with you today. Uh, the events uh, of today highlight a problem that we at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau are working on constantly, which is the issue of elder financial abuse. And I'm pleased to be here at the White House, especially since no sitting president has ever before uh, given the visibility on this issue that President Obama is giving it today. So thank you for your support uh, and your shared concern. As the past few years have revealed all too clearly, uh, financial products have the pro potential to wreak havoc on every individual consumer and on the broader American economy. Older Americans are no exception. And in fact, in many cases, they are the specific targets of unfair, deceptive, or abusive acts and practices uh, in the financial sector. According to one study, in 2010, older Americans lost almost $3 billion to the silent crime of financial exploitation. We all know that our economy is in the process of recovering from the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression. We cannot and will not tolerate practices that intentionally exploit older Americans. <coughs> The new Consumer Bureau was created with the mission of making financial markets work for consumers. This mission is critical for consumer credit and other financial products and services we all know play a major part in our lives. We're talking here about mortgages, credit cards, student loans, bank accounts, debit cards, debt collection, credit reports, payday loans, and many other matters that help shape the ways and means of how we manage our affairs. In all of these consumer markets, we're working to ensure fairness, transparency, and accountability. In a free market that works properly, consumers should be able to make direct comparisons among competing products, and they should not have to worry about being victimized by unfair, deceptive, or abusive practices. We also are working diligently to educate, engage, and empower consumers. We want to make sure that consumers receive the information they need 
information that is accessible and provided in plain language in order to make the best financial decisions for themselves and their families. No one will protect consumers better than consumers who are able to protect themselves. Essential to this objective is that prices and risks are made clear up front and that key information is not hidden from consumers or buried deep in the fine print. While we work on behalf of all consumers, the legislation that created our new agency expressly recognized the needs of seniors when it comes to financial protection. Congress has required us to have an office specifically devoted to this mission. Our Office of Older Americans is headed by my esteemed colleague, Skip Humphrey, who's here with us today. Skip and his team have a singular focus on improving the financial lives of our growing numbers of seniors. As Secretary Sebelius uh, mentioned earlier, we now have 50 million older Americans in this country and many more reach retirement age each day. By the year 2030, one out of five Americans will be 65 or older. I'll be one of them. <laughs> Moreover, in order to help older Americans, we must also reach out to the millions of Americans who are positioned to be the guardians and protectors of their aging parents. We want to make sure that older Americans of today and tomorrow, and those who care for and about them, are aware of what has been called the signature crime of the 21st century, elder abuse, and in particular, elder financial abuse. The amount of money stolen from seniors has risen sharply in recent years. Skip served as the Attorney General in Minnesota, as I did in Ohio. Get us together and we can tell you horrifying stories about these crimes. People looted their pension benefits, were talked into investing much of their life savings in endless varieties of fraudulent schemes. We both heard the heartbreaking stories of older Americans who've lost their entire life savings to a fraudulent lottery or sweepstakes scam, causing them to experience the nightmare of becoming destitute and being placed in a nursing home at the expense of American taxpayers. I recall one man in particular who brought me a four-inch stack of mail, which his elderly mother had received just in the past month after she signed up for one of the phony sweepstake offerings. Many seniors have routines, and their pre predictable patterns make them easier targets for predators. They can be lonely or overly trusting, and we now have many methods by which perfect strangers can communicate with them, often anonymously or posing as someone they are not. Seniors may be dependent on caretakers who are able to access their finances. Abusers often assume that the victim will be too embarrassed or too frail to pursue legal action against them, and unfortunately that assumption too often is proven to be correct. We need to work together to stop this from happening. With many older Americans suffering from some degree of cognitive impairment, it is even more essential that they have someone on their side, someone who will stand up for them and fight for them. The Consumer Bureau is taking action. Today we're announcing an initiative to help older Americans make good, responsible decisions when they choose their financial advisors. Our initiative will evaluate how financial advisors obtain certifications that designate them as the best advisors for older Americans. We want to know where those designations are coming from, and we want to know whether or not older Americans and their families can easily find out which designations are legitimate. Let me say clearly that misuse of these credentials constitutes elder financial abuse. And we also want to know more about the most common ways that older Americans are exploited and what kind of financial education is available to them as they choose their financial advisors. We will use the information we collect to inform our policy making process. We want to know what is working and what is not so we can fix what is not working. Older Americans need to be able to take comfort in the fact that their financial advisor is actually looking out for their best interests. Right now, we know that too often the opposite is the case. Some of these people call themselves experts in senior finances after having received only a few hours of inadequate training. We need to distinguish between the true experts and those engaged in predatory conduct. This kind of accountability is essential to protecting our seniors. In addition to older Americans, Congress also directed our new Consumer Bureau to focus on protecting service members. For us, that group includes all veterans, so we will also look specifically at fraudulent and deceptive practices targeted at older veterans and military retirees. We see a growing problem centered around what's called aid in attendance, a VA benefit that provides in-home assistance for low-income, severely disabled veterans. Veterans are being advised to transfer their money into irrevocable trusts 
in order to reduce their savings to a low enough level to qualify for aid and attendance. This often works out poorly, as they may be denied eligibility, but in the meantime have lost legal access to their own retirement funds. We're also concerned about military pension buyout schemes. Military retirees are offered lump sum cash payments in return for surrendering their rights to their pension payouts. These schemes often are very bad deals for the retirees. We want to collect information on all these kinds of financial practices. Another part of our mission to stand up for older Americans is our promotion of best practices for educating older adults about how to manage their personal finances. We're currently developing guidelines for programs in senior financial education and counseling. We're coordinating these efforts with our partners in federal, state, and local governments all across the country, many of whom are represented here today. And our reach is even wider because in addition to government officials, we're also collaborating with private and nonprofit organizations that have the wisdom and on-the-ground experience that comes from being in direct contact with older adults on a day-to-day -day basis. Not only do we want older Americans to know how best to manage their finances, but we're also developing a program that will raise awareness about the warning signs, the red flags of fraud and exploitation. It's important that seniors and those around them financial professionals, service agencies, caregivers, family members, and friends be capable of identifying the common indicators of financial abuse. Sometimes the indicators are obvious. Property and belongings are missing or bills are going unpaid. Sometimes they're more subtle. Withdrawals that fly under the radar, a suspicious signature here or there. It's important for trusted individuals to plan ahead for the potential incapacity of an older person they care for and can protect. Those individuals should create powers of attorney, trusts, or joint accounts. These mechanisms allow them to keep tabs and be vigilant monitors of how the seniors' money is being spent. During my time in local government, we recognized that newly unpaid property tax bills were a red flag that seniors were in danger of losing their homes and needed help. We went out of our way to work with them in a very personal manner to help them rectify their situations and remain in their homes. From that experience, I learned that it is essential for us to reach out to the caretaker generation, people like myself with an elderly parent. My father is 94. He grew up during the Great Depression, and he's always been remarkably self-sufficient, both before he got married at age 38, after his family had given up on him, and for the past 32 <laughs> years uh, as a widower. Those in our generation need to take time to learn the best ways to detect problems that are emerging as our parents and other old Americans we know undergo changes through the aging process, changes that are natural and inevitable and cannot just be wished away. In their golden years, it's all the more important that we hold ourselves to the venerable command of honoring our fathers and our mothers. If we really love them, then we should do the work of figuring out how best to protect them and their hard-earned money, money they have scraped to put together over the course of a lifetime of hard work against scams, frauds, and other abuses. When prevention does not work, and when people are unable to protect themselves, we will use our powers to go after financial service providers who prey on seniors by violating federal consumer laws. Everyone who's willing to partner with us to do that work is a worthy ally in this noble cause. We will work with state attorneys general, insurance commissioners, legislators, and all other relevant federal, state, and local officials to protect our older Americans. At the Consumer Bureau, we take an all-of-the-above approach to protecting the nation's consumers and especially to protecting older Americans. The silent crime of financially exploiting the elderly is widespread and it is devastating. It is critical for us to act. The generation that rebuilt and sustained this nation out of a devastating depression, the dark hours of World War II, and the anxious fears of the Cold War deserve our care now in their turn. And so I look forward to working with all of you here today as we find the means to provide that care and show ourselves to be the worthy heirs of their great achievements. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming this morning. Your leadership is incredibly important, so thank you all. This is very much. important to all of us, too. So as we let our speakers flow, How are we doing on the tweeting? <laughs> okay, so the hashtag is protect seniors. Let me give you some things to tweet about. Uh, we are very pleased that the secretary has an editorial today in USA Today on elder abuse. We were not able to 
quickly produce copies because there's so many of you, fortunately. But it was posted online last night. It's been published in the print version of uh, USA Today. So you can tweet about that on Protect Seniors. We want to make sure everybody sees uh, this, uh, this wonderful uh, editorial and op-ed the Secretary has, has um, published or the USA Today has published. The Secretary also mentioned a funding announcement, the $5.5 million funding announcement for investment in elder abuse prevention activities. The funding announcement will be posted at 10.30 at hhs.gov HHS if people want to go look uh, for the funding announcement. Uh, I also want to just give a shout out to, to Mr. Sandman leave too, because he was here. I just wanted to also uh, mention Mr. Sandman with the Legal Services Corporation. He and I had a chance to meet some time ago. I mean, this was not recently, but maybe a year and a half ago or so. And I uh, kind of came out to him as a once and forever legal aid lawyer. Uh, and that is how uh, I also have been exposed to issues of elder abuse in many aspects of my career, but certainly when I was a legal services lawyer. So we are very pleased uh, with the announcement from the Department of Justice continuing to work with Legal Services Corporation and their providers. Uh, I know both personally and professionally the role of lawyers in helping seniors, so I'm very pleased uh, with, so far, what we've been able to uh, accomplish today. There's more to come. We're going to switch and we have a video to show you and then we have a speaker and we'll, then we'll pull up a panel and uh, be able to give you um, some, some more detailed information about what's going on in terms of prevention. So let me turn it over, I think, to the, to the um, video. And this is the video. It's called One Scam Away. It's courtesy of the Senior Resource Center of Colorado. It's a part of the National Council on Aging's One Campaign Away, uh, one, one Away Campaign, excuse me, for Elder Financial Security. So we'd like to thank uh, NCOA. Uh, NCOA plays a critical role uh, here in Washington and across the country in advocating for seniors. So I present to you their video. My sister, she started uh, receiving uh, information uh, by phone and by mail from Jamaica that she was sending money uh, every month to Jamaica on this fraud. I immediately went right out that afternoon to her residence and talked to her about it and she admitted what she was doing. She was sending the money and that she was going to get $2 million. I was made aware that the Arvada Police Department uh, had checked in on the case. Had her brother not got involved, the Jamaicans would have cleaned her out. They do not stop until they have every last night, dime or nickel, and uh, they would have just cleaned her out. Uh, fortunately, he did get involved, um, even though a vast amount of her money was gone, uh, he got involved towards the end and was able to save what little she had left. My sister's uh, economic uh, situation is compromised right now uh, until uh, my son and I are able to uh, adjust some of the accounts uh, that she has or go through bankruptcy. Income from Social Security uh, to pay her uh, living expenses and try to pay any debt there is physically impossible. So I think bankruptcy is, uh, is in the cards very, very soon. Usually what we tell people, if it looks too good to be true, it is too good to be true. And what, what they need to do is, and, and many times it's difficult because that, that person, that uh, uh, senior citizen is convinced that because, because these scammers are very, they, they, they do a lot of grooming, and they're very, they're very uh, good at this. They're convinced that this is gonna be good for them, good for their families. A lot of times they're doing it for their families, leaving money behind for their families. Uh, it, then it's, a uh, family member needs to be aware of what's going on, ask the right questions, and then seek help. Go, go to a law enforcement agency, because you'd rather be safe than sorry. The bad news is we still have dozens and dozens of friends or family members who find out about the scam, and oftentimes the seniors don't call me because they're embarrassed or they, or they don't want anybody to know they've been scammed. 
but a friend or a relative will call me and say, wow, this is what happened. I'll contact him, give him some information, but sadly the money is gone once it leaves this country in a wire. If you have a senior citizen, uh, you have to stay close to them, know what they're doing, and it's hard. They do not want to give up their independence and uh, they shield from you, but you can't let that happen. Uh, you've got to move in, then if you sense something, as I did, uh, check it out. Uh, intervene. It might be hard, but it's the best thing to do. And I wish I had been there sooner. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, that was a video that was um, brought to us courtesy of the National Council on Aging, so we're very, very pleased. Uh, I next am, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, our next couple of speakers. I've been making the rounds and asking the same question, and you'll get a sense of this theme. My general question is, will you help? And everyone keeps saying yes. And the next person that I'm pleased to introduce is one of those people that uh, I had a chance to meet with Carolyn Coleman many months ago, and she and I have met on a couple of occasions uh, to talk specifically about what we can do to work together. Carolyn Colvin was uh, confirmed by the U.S. Senate as President Obama's nominee as Deputy Commissioner of Social Security in 2010. Uh, she has served in this capacity as the Chief Operating Officer at Social Security Administration, is a member of the President's Management Council, and is the Secretary of the Social Security Board of Trustees. Uh, she, before being appointed to these positions at Social Security, also worked in other policy positions at SSA. She comes to us from the state of Maryland, where she worked in the state of Maryland, and is someone who's a true reflection of a person who's seen the issues on the ground, both locally uh, and a state level, and now federally. Uh, I know from working with Carolyn that she is deeply committed uh, to this partnership and working on these efforts. We put in your folder today information, fact sheet, about the Elder Justice Coordinating Council that Secretary Sebelius has announced, and I would just point out in the membership of the council that we have identified that a critical partner at the federal level in working on elder abuse is the Social Security Administration. So I'm very pleased to join Carolyn Coleman, and please join me in welcoming Carolyn Coleman this morning. Good morning. It's so great to see so many of you here this morning. I want to first thank Assistant Secretary uh, Greenlee for uh, her leadership um, on this very important uh, effort. Uh, her steadfast leadership in heightening the awareness of financial exploitation uh, to seniors is just so great. Um, uh, I've had the opportunity to meet uh, with her and talk with her about a number of issues and I was very pleased to have the opportunity to work with her on this initiative. And it is so rewarding uh, to see the uh, federal partners come together. And again, this happened under uh, Secretary Greenlee's leadership. And I was surprised last night to uh, learn of the role of the financial community. So I really want to uh, thank the uh, financial um, leaders for their uh, participation and their involvement. Um, you really ought to be commended for your proactive our work in trying to address this problem. And I believe that this is really the time uh, to do it. Uh, it is, um, I think, um, one of our passions in uh, the Social Security Administration to assure that uh, our seniors have the benefits that they're entitled to. So we work very hard to ensure that, that we get the right benefit uh, in the right amount at the right time to individuals. And we certainly then want to ensure that that benefit is used for their uh, own welfare and not uh, used uh, by other individuals. Um, I'm going to uh, share with you just very briefly some of the strategies that we have initiated within the Social Security Administration to try to protect our beneficiaries from uh, financial exploitation. You may be surprised to know that we uh, administer $60 billion each month to 60 million beneficiaries. So over a year, we are putting out well over $720 uh, billion. Uh, now, all of that is not to seniors, but a significant amount of it is. Um, we provide service to over 65% of all seniors who are over the age of 65. 
Uh, and as you well know, many of our seniors rely totally on Social Security for the benefits that they receive, for the resources that they're going to need just to take care of their basic uh, living expenses. Um, I'm pleased to say that there's very little incidence of fraud in our programs, but unfortunately there are instances of financial uh, exploitation. Uh, and from our perspective, any, uh, any instance of financial exploitation is too much. Um, let me talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been trying to do uh, to address this, uh, I would say, horrible issue and at the same time uh, uncover any fraudulent activities. One is um, the uh, desire to protect um, the personal identifying information uh, of our recipients. So we call it PII. But it is so critical that we help individuals understand the importance of not giving out their personal information. We certainly make sure that within the agency that we protect it. Uh, our staff are not even allowed to access records unless they have a need to do so. So we recognize that with the age of electronics that this is a very uh, challenging area for us, but we work very hard to uh, protect beneficiary PII. We have very stringent policies uh, and in place, very, um, very clear procedures in place regarding handling PII. We have severe penalties if those policies and procedures are not followed. Uh, the senior population is uh, very vulnerable to uh, these scams and uh, deceptive promotions, as our previous speakers have indicated. Uh, I know that you hear about some of the horror stories in the media. Uh, we try to get out front of that uh, so that our staff are working with uh, seniors, with caregivers and advocates to uh, remind them uh, not to share personal identifiable information like the date of birth, uh, Social Security numbers, and now everybody asks you for your Social Security number. Uh, but in some instances, you really need to question their need for that. Uh, we remind them not to give out their Medicare claim numbers or bank account information. Uh, and we urge them to keep their personal information in a safe place, not to write it down and have uh, those documents uh, all over the uh, place. And trying to remember your PIN numbers, I know how difficult that is but you've got to figure out how to do that. And for us, if it's difficult, you can imagine how difficult it is for the seniors. And to take the time to shred personal documents and not just put them out uh, for trash where they are a subject to be retrieved by people who are of ill uh, intent. Uh, these may seem to be small um, things to do, but they're very important. And if you don't do them, you will find very quickly that you can, in fact, uh, fall to um, financial exploitation. Uh, we have a very special initiative um, that we are focusing on for seniors who are uh, 100 years of age and older, uh, which is our Centenarian Review Initiative. And it was interesting because we've taught our seniors so well not to give out information. When we learned that we had over 40,000 uh, individuals on our rolls who are 100 years of age and older, we thought in order to be able to make a personal contact, we would start by calling them on the phone. <laughs> we were very pleased to find out that when we called them, they said, we don't know you, and they would hang out. <laughs> so we taught them well. But that then meant that we had to have personal contact with all 39 plus thousand of them um, to determine, first of all, that they were still alive. Uh, second, to make sure that the information that we had, such as their mailing address and things of that nature, uh, were um, those, uh, that those um, pieces of information were correct. And then to see if any of them were at risk and may need a representative pay or someone to help them to handle their affairs. Um, you know, many uh, who are 100 years of age and older are able to handle their uh, own affairs. And of course, not any surprise to you, some of us who are less than 100 probably need some help with managing our affairs. But we are doing that initiative, and as resources uh, allow us to uh, reduce that age, we will. But right now, we're uh, actually making personal contact with everyone who is on our rolls who are uh, 100 years of age and older. Did you realize that we had that many people on Social Security? 139 plus, almost 40,000. And really the main effort is one, to make sure that uh, they are well and that they are able to handle their own affairs. And this is going to make it, it uh, even more important now as we are getting totally away from paper checks and the money will be going into uh, direct deposit. Um, the opportunity for 
uh, fraudulent activity or for financial exploitation is even stronger. The second effort, which is one of our largest efforts, is our representative payee program. And this is a program that provides for the financial management of benefits for individuals who are unable to handle this for themselves. We have about 5 million representative payees on our rolls, not nearly enough when you think about the fact that we have 60 million uh, beneficiaries. So we certainly are always looking to uh, find suitable uh, representative payees, and again, I know you've I read some of the media reports where even representative pays that we've checked out tend not to do the right thing. Uh, we really rely on uh, community uh, members and family members and others who um, uh, suspect that something is not uh, being done uh, as it should be to call us. You know, we have a hotline uh, so that if you don't want to be identified, uh, you don't have to be. And uh, we can then go out and investigate and make sure that nothing uh, inappropriate is happening there. The uh, main responsibilities of the pays are to really just assist uh, the individual in paying current and uh, foreseeable needs and to properly save their benefits and to utilize them to meet their current needs. Uh, you know that often uh, it's a family member who is involved in the financial exploitation and unfortunately the majority of our representative pays are members of families. Our family members, so we cannot assume that just because it's a family member that they're going to do the right thing. Even at the local level when I was dealing with elder abuse, physical abuse, I was surprised to learn that it was often the family member who was um, committing that activity. So we cannot assume that it's just someone who's a friend or someone who has stepped in because they care about the individual. Um, we partner with government and non-government organizations to assist us with the rep payee effort. So I've been working very closely and throughout the country, you know, we have 10 regions, so we've been working very closely with those offices to uh, help us find suitable beneficiaries. Whenever I go to a field office, I ask to meet with all of the stakeholders in the community, um, usually their um, representatives of aging organizations or disability organizations, homeless organizations, um, substance abuse organizations, um, any group in the community who cares about the residents to talk to them. It's usually a listening session just to hear from them what they think we need to be doing uh, to better protect um, the individuals that we serve, uh, to address any concerns or problems that they have. Living in a 55 plus building, um, every day I get a social security issue. Uh, and I say it's not necessarily that I know the answer, I just know where to find the answer. And so we always try to come back and tell them uh, what they need to do. Um, I'm pleased to announce our, our new effort um, where we have a collaborative effort with the Administration on, Age, on Community Living, uh, uh, with um, Secretary Sebelius and the National Alliance for Mental Illness, uh, who will also be trying to assist us in this effort. And I uh, solicit your help uh, because we really need to find more um, representative pays throughout the country. And I know that many of you are here from various parts of the country. Um, this effort will help us to really locate volunteer rep pays, but we do also accept organizational pays. Um, there are groups who, who are involved in providing human services, et cetera, at the local level and they often uh, come in and uh, there is a fee available to those who are organizational pays. Uh, in July 2012, we will launch the webinar, Social Security Needs Your Help to Find Good Representative Payees. So we hope that you'll be aware of that and that you will act accordingly. And our goal is just to educate uh, communities to this uh, very uh, difficult situation and uh, also to help individuals contact us when they see individuals in the community that they believe might be in need of a payee. And also, um, we will hope that that uh, webinar will um, get more people to um, report suspected uh, cases of abuse. Uh, other collaborative efforts, uh, I'm very pleased that with our ongoing discussions and brainstorming sessions with the Administration on Aging and now the staff of the Administration on Community Living, that we are trying to identify neutral business processes and commonalities where we might be able to uh, better leverage our resources. We're looking for better ways to share information among our agencies at the service delivery level to ensure that our staff are equally aware 
uh, of uh, signs of potential exploitation. You know, we have an OIG hotline, but we find that our first offense uh, against abuse or fraud is through our employees who interact and uh, suspect that there's something not quite uh, as it should be, and they will call the hotline and refer cases. So we do that on an ongoing basis. We also are exploring uh, joint training opportunities uh, to uh, help in recruiting uh, the payees, but also in identifying um, fraudulent activity. We are looking for ways to work more closely with you at the local and state level. I came out of local and state government. You know, government is somewhat removed from what's happening on the ground, uh, certainly at the federal level, so we really rely on you at the local and state level. How many of you are community leaders uh, other than government? Most of you? Okay, so we need you too. And I'm very, very pleased to learn what you're doing in the financial community. Uh, we're excited about that. If you are, um, think of ways that Social Security can become more involved with you, uh, we would like to do that. So in closing, I want to um, remind everyone that if you suspect uh, fraud and abuse, um, regarding uh, Social Security's benefits, we encourage you to contact our Office of the Inspector General. Let me give you that number. It's 1-800-269-0271. Uh, again, I want to thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to join you today. Again, I want to thank Kathy for her leadership, and I'd just like to leave you with a quote of uh, Margaret Mead's, uh, which is never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed individuals can change the world. It's the only thing that ever does. So it only takes one of you to make a difference. So with the spirit of collaboration uh, and the level of commitment that I see here today, I am confident that we will make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Coleman. It's good to, good to see you. Well, we mentioned earlier, and something that you all recognize, uh, but I think is worth repeating, that um, elder abuse and financial ex exploitation of elders is not a federal issue. Uh, it's a national issue. It's an international issue. And if we're going to tackle, prevent, uh, and, and respond to financial exploitation, we must engage with the financial services sector. So I'm very pleased uh, that you all from, from financial services banks and other brokerage firms are here today. Uh, I had the opportunity last fall to meet with Steve Bartlett. Uh, Mr. Bartlett is the president and CEO of the Financial Services Roundtable. He served in that capacity since June of 1999. Previously, he served as the mayor of Dallas, Texas, and also on the Dallas City Council, and served for eight years in the United States Congress. Uh, I'm very pleased that Mr. Bartlett is here today, and he is going to introduce our next speaker. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Bartlett. Thank you. Thank you I must say, I, I thank uh, Madam Secretary, uh, your, your support, your leadership, and your pushing this issue to uh, help us all make a, a step forward. Uh, and uh, Commissioner Galvin, I very much appreciate your kind words and your uh, re recognition and stay, saying out loud and verbally that, in fact, the front lines and the back lines are those of financial service providers themselves who set out every single day with a total commitment to protect our customers and to protect our family members, our community members, and, and our customers because we're the keepers of the vaults. That's where the money is. And the bad guys, the fraudsters, the thieves, that's where they want to get. And so our job that we recognize and, in fact, set out every day is to uh, prevent that and, uh, and avoid that. Uh, so a couple of years ago, when as a financial services roundtable, as a trade association with our technology partner, BITS, uh, began to engage in this, uh, we set out to identify both what's happening, uh, what else can happen, what needs to be done, uh, to prevent uh, and further prevent financial ex exploitation. And we made, and my, my purpose here is to introduce uh, the, the CEO of Wells Fargo uh, Financial Advisors as a, as a way of describing what we discovered then, today, and what we'll be doing over the next several, uh, several years. What we discovered, and it's pretty astounding, is that of our 100 companies, which are the largest companies, about 70% of the, of the retail activities, of the financial activities in this country, uh, every single one of them had then and has now 
a robust and a determined and a total commitment to preventing financial abuse, particularly uh, of, with our elder uh, with our elder customers, because we realize that that is both our obligation, it's the right thing to do, uh, and it's something that we take uh, quite quite seriously. Indeed, uh, we provide the education, the prevention, the identification, the intervention, and then the reporting that abuse to uh, to law enforcement agencies and to appro appropriate agencies. And we take that uh, role very seriously. We, we, we started by surveying uh, our 100 companies uh, just to f find out kind of what are they doing and what else has to, has to be done. And I can tell you that every single one of them responded with a specific, a planned, and a quite proactive and aggressive program for this uh, for this activity. Uh, many of them are here to here, here today. Uh, TD Bank, uh, uh, Comerica, Bank West, SunTrust, Principal, uh, and others. And I, if I didn't see you, well, then that means I, I still love you very much. I just didn't see your uh, see your name tags. But there was there was not an exception. We didn't find a single company that didn't have a totally committed uh, leadership from the leadership. And then one thing that we discovered was that there was, all of my CEOs are, uh, are equal, but one is more equal than others in this case. And that is we discovered uh, a, an individual who's quite revered, uh, somewhat of an icon in the uh, financial advisors uh, industry has put together a led with a visionary status, a rather phenomenal organization in investing $1.2 trillion of, quite well, by the way, of clients, uh, clients' assets. Uh, Danny Ludeman of the has had a lot of other things to do because he's got 1.2 trillion dollars to uh, to watch over, but he had made a personal and a quite robust and strong commitment both on his own behalf and on behalf of Wells Fargo Financial Advisors to make sure that we do it right, to make sure that every single opportunity to protect those investment, to protect those assets of our of our elderly clients that we're going to set out to do. He has 18,000 financial advisors that do that uh, work uh, with him. Uh, I, I would dare to say, Danny, that every single one of them knows of your commitment uh, to preventing financial exploitation of, uh, of their elderly uh, uh, customers. Uh, he also has a commitment to just community services in general. Last year, uh, Wells Fargo Financial Advisors, this one segment of Wells Fargo, donated $12 million to uh, charitable organizations and provided 98,000 volunteer hours to 600 charities. They organized, uh, they've organized and, and operate training and informational content for the prevention of elder uh, financial abuse, and they, ho they have hosted uh, countless regional seminars all and continue to do so around the country uh, to make certain that every one of those 18,000 financial advisors understands that it is there. While they're doing their day job of increasing the assets uh, of their customers, uh, they also have to do that job of making sure that they're protected from financial exploitation. So I present to you the CEO of Wells Fargo Financial Advisors, a man with a total commitment to this, Danny Ludeman. Danny. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. It was a very nice introduction. Uh, it's an extreme honor for me to be here with all of you. Um, didn't realize there's so many people in the room sitting in the front row here. Um, and uh, it's also uh, nice to be among so many Midwesterners that are uh, here today. I live in St. Louis, Missouri now with my family. I moved there about five years ago from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, my mom was extremely happy because uh, I was born in Columbus, Ohio, and she was glad that I was going back to my Midwestern roots, so I'm a Buckeye through and through. But it is uh, a, uh, it's an honor, really, for me to have the opportunity to spend some time with you today uh, on behalf of uh, our whole company, uh, Wells Fargo, and our 270,000 teammates that are located across uh, this great nation. Uh, as one of the largest financial services company, uh, we serve 70 million um, customers and clients. That's one out of every three households in America has a relationship with Wells Fargo. And so as you might imagine, as Steve uh, said, the issue of elder abuse is one we are keenly focused on. And I want to thank, as others have done, Secretary um, Sebelius and uh, Secretary Greenlee, uh, for both their foresight and leadership in organizing this wonderful gathering. Uh, we really have the opportunity today to do something extraordinary, and that's establish a new partnership, a national partnership, 
that uh, addresses a very pressing social issue that affects some of our nation's most vulnerable citizens. And this is also an issue that's very near and dear to my heart because uh, my grandmother was a victim of elder fraud, 90-year-old um, grandmother that um, um, uh, lived in southern Florida. Uh, my grandfather passed away about 20 years before this occurred. Very, um, he was a very successful businessman, left her with a wonderful uh, retirement, if you will. Uh, but unfortunately, the caregivers that had been uh, so-called caregivers had been taking care of her for over 20 years, depleted all of her resources, every single penny, and she came and lived with us for the last five years of her life. So um, like you, I know that um, you also probably know so many people that have been affected by this. So given what's at stake, it's essential for us to work together to advance a national agenda to protect the financial safety of older Americans. And it's not just a matter of protecting their money. Uh, it's also about making sure we're protecting their hopes, we're protect, uh, protecting their dreams, uh, and protecting, maybe most of all, their dignity. And so it's wonderful that um, we have so many here from vital response organizations with us today. For the financial services industry, this issue is becoming even more urgent as we serve an aging generation of more than some 70 million baby boomers, many who are already caring for elderly parents. Um, and as each of our panelists mentioned earlier, this is already a very big problem. And its sheer size, I think, belies the impact on the lives of real people many who are our clients, who we work and interact with every single day, who look to us and other banks and financial services firms for help when they've been victimized. Unfortunately, those who commit this type of crime have more tools at their disposal today than ever before, and they're finding lots of new ways to use them. Uh, lately, for example, there's uh, growing evidence that scammers are targeting older investors with self-directed IRAs. It's a big problem. Um, and it's also disheartening that this type of abuse continues to occur despite the regulatory focus, the robust uh, tools, training, and policies that are in place, as Steve mentioned, at, at most banks and brokerage firms. You see, we have excellent systems in place for addressing employees who violate their responsibilities. But one of the things I think we need to talk about, one of the big dialogues we need to have collectively, and one of the things we need to consider is whether privacy laws, uh, fears of liability, or restrictions on actions uh, might sometimes prevent needed action when the elderly are victims of scams or even worse, victims of family members and caregivers. So I do hope we'll be able to spend some time on that particular topic because sometimes we see a lot of things happening and we're not able to do something about it because some of these conflicting um, actions that are out there. So as institutions that have been trusted with our clients' financial assets, uh, financial services companies have a major responsibility to address this issue. And we are committed at Wells Fargo to do everything in our power to make certain that we're not only advising, not only serving, but we're also protecting older Americans as we need to, and quite honestly, as they deserve to be. Um, at Wells Fargo Advisors, uh, we have um, lots of elderly clients. Some of you might find this statistic interesting. More than half of our clients are 60 years old or older. So this is clearly a matter of tremendous concern for us. And I want to just share with you a couple things that we've been doing uh, to address this issue. About two years ago, we established a legal response team which works with all of our financial advisors in all 50 states who raise concerns about possible cases of elder uh, financial abuse. Uh, reflecting the extent of the problem, or maybe another way to put it would be reflecting the growing awareness of this problem. This team now handles 60 new reports each month. 
and that's growing very, very fast, unfortunately. And when they find that the advisor's concerns are warranted, they see a request for, you know, money being wired out to one of these programs that you heard about on the video. Um, um, this team engages with Adult Protective Services to investigate and address the situation. And uh, we'd welcome the chance to share more about this program with any other form, uh, with any other firm or organization that's really interested in knowing how it works. You learn an awful lot by being kind of at the epicenter of really where the money is, as Steve mentioned. Uh, in addition, last year we launched a series of symposiums in eight cities around the U.S. that uh, brings together members of lots of different groups, public, nonprofit, legal, law enforcement, and financial services, much as what we're doing here today, uh, to really build a collaborative response to elder abuse in each of our local communities. Uh, these are just some of the initial steps that we're taking on a path that we need to keep following. And today, I'm very pleased to tell you that Wells Fargo will soon complete a memorandum of understanding with the U.S. Administration on Aging to work as a partner in, in training initiatives that will help create a national response to elder financial abuse. It's a big deal for us. Thank you. We've been working on this for a long time. And uh, we're very pleased to announce this. This effort with the AOA underscores, I think, our company's determination to eliminate this threat to the financial safety of our elders. Uh, what's more, Wells Fargo is also working on a commitment with other elder services organizations to support not only the creation but the distribution of training programs for adult protective services staffs across the country. Uh, as well as we've established a website where older Americans and their families can quickly find local services to respond to their concerns about uh, financial abuse or, or fraud. Uh, additionally, I'm also happy to report that Wells Fargo and Company about two weeks ago uh, made prevention and elimination of elder financial abuse one of its top corporate priorities across all of its businesses, not only the one that I run at Wells Fargo Advisors. And as you, as you might imagine, this is a multifaceted effort. Uh, it includes enhanced training, communication, as well as a new elder financial abuse component in a program that's been very successful at our firm called Hands-On Banking. Uh, this is a financial education curriculum. We feel great responsibility to increase financial literacy. Uh, as a lot of you know, more people spend time each year planning their summer vacation than they do on their financial matters. And so this program goes a long way to uh, providing financial education in communities across America. So in effect, by incorporating this initiative at the Wells Fargo level and incorporating some of this, uh, the components of elder financial abuse, we're mobilizing more than a quarter of a million Wells Fargo team members in all states across the largest branch network that exists in America. So we're very excited about that. Thank you. I also want to acknowledge one individual uh, in the room today who works very close with me. He's a good friend of mine. I've known him pretty much all his life. Uh, and that is Bob Mooney. Uh, Bob Mooney is one of our um, most senior executives at Wells Fargo Advisors. Uh, he's a senior managing director. He heads up the compliance area for us. He does a lot more than just that. That's his kind of official title. But uh, without Bob Mooney's efforts over the last 10 years, we would not be, as a firm, where we are today. And I just uh, cannot thank him enough for all he's done. <laughs> So, you know, we hope that these programs will truly make a difference, and we're truly encouraged that so many institutions are focused on, on this issue. And I think this gathering taking place at the White House uh, at a setting like this underscores not only the urgency of the problem, uh, but it also underscores the nation's commitment, really, to solve this problem. Um, for those of us in the financial 
services industry, uh, we know that the bottom line can never, ever again refer to just the income statement. Uh, for us, the bottom line always, always has to be serving the best interest of those who've entrusted us with their savings and who look to us to help them to literally achieve their life aspirations. And uh, the insights that we share here today can literally be life-changing. And so in closing, I just want to thank all of you so much for being here, uh, for um, your time, uh, your creativity, uh, and most of all, your energy, because this is going to require a lot of our energy uh, to solving this problem. And I'm absolutely convinced that by working together, all of us working together, we will find a way that older Americans enjoy the financial security that they work so hard to create in the first place. Thank you very much for giving us the time.